Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Horizon Cloud Summit. I'm Mark Dietrich with the EGI Foundation and part of the, e the Horizon Cloud Project, which is sponsoring this event. And today we're going to move, uh, if you've been following our, our summit, we just had a, present, a, session, a panel session on research challenges. And now we're going to move from the research end to the business end. And we're going to look and see how we can actually bring some of these new business ideas to, to the market and to a profitable environment. So to kick off this panel and to moderate this panel, we have uh, uh, our colleague, Enrique Arezaga, excuse me, <laughs> from uh, Technalia. He is the he is uh, the project manager of the ICT division at Technalia, and we're glad to have him. He's very experienced executive in the telecommunications industry and has uh, experience with a lot of specific advanced technologies such as uh, uh, fiber to the home and IPTV. So I'm going to hand it over to Enrique now to introduce. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Uh, well, uh, well, as you have mentioned, I work for Ternalia, but I also have a lot of experience with, uh, because I've been, and I still, you know, I am a CEO of a, on a startup. So I know what is also the, the difficult path for, from the, uh, when you are just trying just to, uh, to start a business and, and make it successful. Uh, so that's uh, probably something that we would use today because, you know, the, the panel today uh, is the, a discussion about the accelerating cloud business innovation. And um, we have to, today today just have a different approach to what uh, we have been done so far, where the, mostly all the stakeholders are invited uh, to share the view. And uh, also they are, most, most of them, they are uh, big players uh, so that they, they take a, a lot of time down. Uh, when they start just with the research until the research is just coming in something that can be just brought to the market. However, uh, today I have the pleasure just to have a, a panel where we have uh, two, uh, I would say, SMEs, or at least uh, uh, we will also have the, the support uh, from two accelerators or incubators, uh, depending on uh, not later on, they will explain us a little bit how they do it. And we also have the support from Thailand that it will also help us to uh, understand which is uh, the challenges regarding the, the GDPR or either private uses uh, when we are just going moving from uh, from on-site uh, services to to the cloud. So that's uh, I I hope that today we will have a very interesting discussions uh, mainly because uh, for me uh, the SMEs they have both feet on the ground and they need to of course they need to have, to have something that is brought very fast into the market and uh, uh, because the life of the company is depends on of that so uh so let me uh, introduce it uh the, the panelists today uh, uh for please uh, forgive me uh, in advance when I pronounce the family names. I, uh, well, I am from Spain, so sometimes when uh, <laughs> I have very difficult to pronounce it, uh, the family names. So, uh, so let me just uh, introduce uh, Henrik Setmeyer, uh, Ruben Rokes, uh, Julian Fisher, uh, Florian Bogen Schulz, and, and Brendan Rowan. Uh, I will give the, the floor. Oh, so, hello, everyone. Uh, sorry, as yes, for just. Yes, Pronounce it badly, your family name. <laughs> I hope you forgive me. Uh, I will just give you the floor of one minute so that you introduce a little bit uh, at like a round table yourself. And uh, later on, we will just uh, go about the different topics that we will discuss uh, during today's session. Okay, so I will start for the, for the one that I have first to my right on, on the screen. So, Hanritz, uh, could you please just introduce a little bit uh, yourself and your company? Yeah, Heinrich Zettelmeier, I'm the CEO of Scaling. Uh, Scaling is a new service provider that is just, uh, I would say, a little bit more than half a year old, but it is a combination of uh, seven companies across uh, Germany and Europe that combined now an integrated uh, service provider that uh, helps from consulting, implementation, operation of private or public cloud environments and applications and processes on the cloud. Myself, I have a history of IBM, uh, venture capital, and uh, and a lot of startup acceleration. Born in Munich, and uh, but living in Switzerland now. Thank you. Thanks, Henrit. Uh, Ruben, you are the next the next one. 
Sure. So hi everyone, I'm Ruben. I'm a partner at the Brussels-based law firm Timelex. We are a niche law firm specialized in anything that has to do with IT law in the broadest sense, including data protection, security, contracting, litigation. And we serve clients well, basically everywhere uh, in the world, uh, Belgium, the EU, uh, the United States, you know, wherever. A lot of our clients are cloud providers, but also SMEs or larger companies that um, have IT issues. Um, and I'm happy to be here today to explain a bit the legal context of uh, the cloud business. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ruben. So Julian, it's now your turn. Yeah, my name is Julian Fischer. I'm CEO of any nines. Uh, we are basically focused on digital transformation with a strong focus on building and operating application development platforms. Among our customers, um, um, large industry uh, organizations from various industries, um, including banking, insurances, manufacturing industry, and so on. And um, it's all about, um, you know, picking up uh, more efficiency with uh, adapting modern technology. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Julian. Uh, Florian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. My name is Florian and I'm, I actually do have the best job in the world at the moment uh, because <laughs> I'm CEO of Vira and what we do is while our parent company O2 Telefonica builds the great 5G network, we find the fitting use cases um, running on that network. So we are the corporate accelerator of Telefonica. I'm also an, a founder. I founded two companies in the hospitality area, but now I do help other founders to make revenues with Telefonica. Thanks. Thanks, Florian. Uh, Brendan, finally, can you please introduce a little bit? Yeah, no problem. So uh, my name is Brendan. I'm a managing consultant here at Blue Specs. We are a we support the adoption of advanced technologies amongst companies, big and small. And really today, I probably have a point of view from both sides. So we've got programs which support companies in diverse areas, such as space tech, AI, IoT. And also we have our sister company, uh, IoT Tribe, which runs pure acceleration programs that we also have crossover between us. And uh, probably some experience as well that I have from supporting SMEs as well in traditional SMEs, trying to make that leap across into uh, more digital operations and more uh, manufacturing point of view as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Brent. So that uh, I think that's more or less ready, yes, for the for the start. Uh, uh, today we would, uh, would like, yes, you know, from, from the... Uh, there are two ways when we talk about business models. Is One of them could be uh, companies that they, they are already have in, uh, their business is already stable. And we would like just to convince them to move into the digital landscape to the cloud computing and then there are others that um, they are uh, very uh, native in the in cloud computing so they start with uh, the purpose that everything is located in the cloud and personal uh, we have been uh, uh, listening about the uh, you know just very famous uh, examples like salesforce for example when they are talking about the second example uh, but um um, my question here is more related to um, to the well. First, I will start like from for the for the uh, SMEs. Okay, how how is the, your perception nowadays? Is the is the companies that when they are starting new business just thinking from the very beginning just to go to the cloud, or uh, there is still a long way just to go just to convince them that uh, you know the future is everything is digital and. Uh, in, uh, as the European Commission says, by 2025 or even by 2030, at least most of the uh, public services will be uh, digital. Uh, what is your your perception in this way? I mean, anyone? I mean, do you prefer just to be a round table, or do you just yes, you start just? <laughs> well, at any nine, what I can say is, um, we've been working with startup customers. Uh, for, for nearly a decade uh, before we moved to uh, serve enterprises. So I have seen uh, both uh, smaller organizations and, and larger ones. And in my perception, at least in the software industry, the adoption of uh, cloud computing technologies, in, especially in startups, is quite good. Uh, people are educated. They know what the technology is about and what are the 
the efficiencies. Um, they, they do sometimes struggle with, with legal questions. For example, if you want to go to an Ameri American-backed uh, infrastructure, uh, the question is, uh, is it safe for, let's say, uh, GDPR-wise? Um, so those are struggles they have. And larger organizations, they usually have, you know, a, a huge heritage of, um, of an organization, a culture, products, and they, they have a much longer path to digital transformation and therefore need much more training, time to understand the paradigms that are involved here, and then time to, to get it actually done as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. Also, from my perspective, because it pretty well connects to what Julian said, looking at startups and, and very early stage companies, I mean, from an educational and technical perspective, they know that cloud is the future, right? And they even, we even talk about instant cloudification at the moment with 5G, with the, uh, all the, the, the advantages 5G will bring. I guess, I even guess my phone won't have a hard drive anymore in five years. It will go to the cloud immediately. So, but, and very, again, very, very, somebody got a, yeah, somebody have a call. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no worries. No worries. So, but, but from a, it's very interesting what Julian said about the legal perspective. I mean, we have startups that want to work with Telefonica and obviously O2 is it's better known as O2. And O2 obviously has um, very sensitive data from its customers. So we, when it comes to GDPR, and to data protection, we need to be on the safe side. So let's just assume the startup works with AWS and then they, they want to work with us. And unfortunately, most of the time, what we then need to say is, we are super sorry, but we can't because your data might be located on a server in Europe, but the company is a US company. And due to the new legislation in the US, um, the administration slash government can access the data under some circumstances and the GDPR prevents us then from working with the company. So I would say um, educational wise, your question, the people and the companies are there, but it gets more and more difficult to work with cloud um, because of the current legislation in uh, US and Europe. Thank you. Maybe, uh, maybe Ruben, do you have something to say here? Yes. Um, while I, like, I agree the, the case law in Europe surrounding GDPR has made it a bit of a challenge to work in a globalized cloud environment. Um, I do believe that there are a lot of uh, cowboy stories out there as well, where suddenly we hear American cloud companies, oh, forget it, it's, it's prohibited. I mean, it's not that black and white. There has been case law, for instance, in France, where they evaluated the use of AWS in uh, a specific COVID-19 app that the French government wanted to launch. And there, the castle states it, it's fine. I mean, we don't immediately see a big issue to use an American cloud provider here, given the measures that you've taken. So it, it goes to show that there are a lot of different opinions on what can and cannot be done in cloud uh, under GDPR. But overall, I mean, it's still very workable if you know how to deal with 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 what uh, the legislators and the case law says. So I don't think but you said a very interesting thing. But you said a very interesting thing, Ruben. You said because all of the measures you have taken, so uh, mm -hmm. that's that's that it adds another layer of complexity. I would add. That's true. That no one will deny that you will have a level of complexity, but there are no also, hard prohibitions everywhere. Also, to some extent, um, the the legal status about, let's say, decisions um, in 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 courts or anything that that one thing, but this distribution of information to the to the broader uh, potential target audience is another thing. So, if I'm a small startup, for example, and I want to sell to a large enterprise and say, well, our interpretation is that you can't do it, then I won't get uh, the customer account, and that's my loss. And on the other hand, if, if I have the uncertainty and I believe that it is, is, is that it is not possible, I will not have the competitive advantage. So there is damage done. While I also have to state that 
I think people um, experience GDPR in a negative way, while it actually makes uh, a unique standing saying that the data is to be owned by the people who you know produce the data and not by the people who harvest it. And I think um, in, in, on international grounds, we will see that other countries will adapt GDPR policy frameworks as well, because this is something that has to be done. And I don't think that, for example, players like, like China and America are big idols in how to deal with data privacy in any way. Well, yeah, well, I have some opinion, but probably Heinrich. <laughs> but I think, yeah, but, but I think in general, I mean, startups and, 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 and public cloud computing are unnatural. Yeah, because startups don't have a lot of money. They want to get started quickly. And I think uh, some of the hyperscalers have a good done a good job of, of helping them up. Um, as Florian says, the moment the startup is becoming successful and they're scaling and they're becoming a small and medium enterprise, a lot of more questions are coming up. And then the story gets more complicated. And that's also the moment where I have experienced then startups are ready to ask other people, you know, to ask service providers, how should we really do that? Uh, and, 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 and that's where we come into play. From the regulatory side, I have to say, you know, I'm very much also in the blockchain space. And it's in, in, in Switzerland, there are a lot of these crypto companies, fintech companies, and they, they have started with, with, with Hyperscaler for example, with Microsoft Azure, and they got also their agreements with the public regulator. So, so things are possible. So I think it is, but it is not always, a, it's not always clear. So you have to go a few rounds. Mm -hmm. Brendan, we can hear you, probably you're mute. One round of uh, one, one second. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, yep. perfect. Go ahead. Perfect. No, it's just to, to pick up on your point there, Heinrich. Um, it really is that question of the more technical aspects. So not, not thinking of the legal, but when the companies that we work with and they're starting off, they are cloud native because they are they have access through the hyperscalers to incredible tools that they would never have access to themselves and, and wouldn't have the resources to do it. But then the main challenge that we see is once they start actually scaling is, is where the problem that they encounter. Yeah. And we've seen a couple of companies that have actually had some brilliant products, but they're making it kind of in a garage scenario. You know, they're using AWS or they're using Google uh, because it's kind of relatively low level and cheap. And then a big client comes in, looks for them to scale the number of calls that they have to make or the number of resources that you use. And then the startup goes belly up. I think that's kind of the main challenge that needs to be addressed there is like with hardware previously, you spent a lot of time designing for production. Yeah. And I think the startups think when it comes to cloud, you can just kind of get started and then deal with that problem later. And when they actually have to start implementing on, on, the, on a much larger scale is where the challenge comes. And I think that's more from a technical point of view. So on one side, cloud is great. You can get straight online, you can start building, you can start you know, delivering. And on the other hand, if you're not built for scaling at the early stage, they encounter huge hiccups and some of it may be the regulatory, but it may also then start encountering problems when they have to work with integrators to get access to their larger clients. There's, okay. there's even another interesting point, which kicks in if you become even larger than that. So after you've managed to scale by adopting cloud technology, for example, it may happen that you want to expand a business case uh, globally. And this is when, pro when things become problematic, because while we believe that the hyperscaling market is somehow homogenous and you'd, you'd have regions across the globe that you could easily access. In fact, if you want to sell, for example, a product in China to, uh, to Chinese companies, you're very likely to be forced to be on a, uh, on a, on a Chinese hyperscaler, which means yeah. there is a certain demand for the adoption of multiple hyperscalers which all come with their uh, strong vendor lock-in APIs, um, that, that will create a tooling challenge on how to abstract, for example, keeping your data away from those lock-in technologies while still leveraging a lot of the cloud technologies. So that's, that's a problem we see with large organizations quite a lot. Okay. Well, before we move forward, uh, we, we have a, a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, one of them was related to what uh, Florian has uh, has said. Uh, he says uh, Florian makes a, a great point. 
So it's Florian, this is for you. And uh, this is also linked with, uh, with one of the, uh, the questions that I have later, is how are the uh, European cloud services uh, providers making it easier for European startups to build their business on their platforms? And, uh, and then when you answer, I will just make another question. <laughs> I think it's two, it's two, it's two, um, it's two words, user interface. Oh, sorry, that's two words and user experience. I mean, I mean, just, just imagine, I mean, all of the, most of the telcos in Europe, that's a difficult now because I need to be polite here. And uh, most of the telcos <laughs> in Europe, including my, the, the telco I'm working for, we offer cloud services. Mm -hmm. But only a, a very small amount of people use it. Why is that? It's not only pricing. It's UX and UI. Our APIs are not that good. Customer service in general. And I don't speak about customer service hotline. I speak about um, how easy it is to, to work with it, what you get for your money. It's just not competitive. So that's the answer. Easy, but difficult. And that's, that's yeah, a but, very uh, good point. I mean, uh, if, if I'm allowed to say one thing, can you remember the emergence of OpenStack where the idea was that there will be something like uh, Amazon Web Services just with a vendor neutral perspective and it will spread across all uh, data centers? So how turned that out to, to be? Like this hope hasn't been fulfilled and now, for example, technologies like Kubernetes try to or get a lot of momentum by trying to become that infrastructure abstraction people actually waiting for because you don't want to get locked in somewhere. So if, for example, your company would have uh, an offer, a standardized API, then it would be more likely that people uh, would have a much lower uh, barrier of entry to utilize it. Yeah, in fact, my, my question, well, we have another question from the audience, but before we move into that, um, well, I, I, uh, I answered in previous interviews to some other I would say stakeholders, and we because uh, the European Commission is is pretty much interested about just uh, just being an alternative to the to the big ones from the US and and, and Asia. Well, you, you, you know it. <laughs> uh, just uh, just uh, just promoting what they call cloud federation. Okay, so that's like is, uh, in Europe they are a smaller uh, cloud service provider, so they want to join forces so that they at the end we have something that. Uh, they call it digital autonomy, so that uh, Europe has an alternative to the, the other ones. Uh, when I talked to some of them, they said, uh, "Well, I don't see a really business out of uh, out of that. I mean, it's technical, technically feasible, but when you just go to Amazon or Google or, or Microsoft, they really have a business apart from cloud services. Like about well, Amazon is usually they have the retail services, and then they have." Later, well, uh, they just move into this cloud business because uh, they have some kind of uh, extra uh, resources that they can use for the rest of the year. That's that's what they told me. I mean, this is not my own opinion. Okay, that's that's something that uh, it's, it's when when you just discuss with the people, that's that's what they say. So that's, the things is there. If uh, if uh, Europe would like just to be uh, competitive uh, with the other alternative in Asia and and uh, in America. Uh, what could be the real business that has to be behind it so that uh, at the end, at least the people in Europe, where they will move their business with their alternative in Europe and not the one from America, for example? Um, maybe, Enrico, I, I, I want to offer a, a, a view on that. I think, and I think we have to be realistic. I mean, the hyperscalers are pumping every year hundreds, if not thousands, of new features out in their cloud stack. Yeah, and automate and automate and more and more tool. So the challenge is a little bit to compete with that. And I think it, it, it's very, and it's a true challenge. On the other hand, I think in reality, we will move, in my opinion, more and more in a multi-cloud, hybrid cloud environment. So there is place for many. Yeah? And as I'm also a startup fan <laughs> and, and startup <laughs> investor myself, I see so many super innovative startups still in the cloud environment. And I think they, they, they offer great, great features and value propositions, but in reality, they always will have to think of interoperability. How can I interoperate with what will be already there? Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that, that brings us to the necessity and, and what Julian said, of the coming of all the various tools and technologies to, to, to manage that, that multi-cloud 
situation, a multi-technology situation. Really. So, if if you if you think about why did these hyperscalers succeed, that's something we should also look at because the those are um, inventions or changes that have been pushed into the market with a lot of capital. Um, the they you know they originated in companies which have been funded uh, they they had a tremendous amount of money to develop these technologies and at some point they figured out well we can monetize that as well like if there's why is there no european uh, competition because the structure that let those products to emerge they don't exist in europe in the same way they do for example in america and I'm talking about, for example, private equity funds being capitalized with, with, with billions of euros, uh, pushing money into, into, those, uh, into those highly innovative companies. And um, now, if you know what to build, yes, we could rebuild it, but it's the machinery made out of capital and people that, that will produce more features in the next time. So you don't want to chase the rabbit, you want to get ahead of the game. And in order to get ahead of the game, I think you need you need to have the money, you need to have the people, and you need, you better need to start right away. I think it Any comes back to the ease, it comes back to the ease of access. I think it's that question of of UX. Is in people are not going to no matter how better you can sell them that it's going to you know the performance or the or the functionalities, they're going to pick the easier route. And especially within large organizations, they're used to 10, 15, 20 years. If you think of SAP, you know, as an SAP, how many years that have been around and that became a mainstay and to try and peel someone away from how they always do things or who they always normally work with is one of the challenges. And I think AWS and Google and, and lesser extent IBM have done a great job of making it easy for people to transition. I think it goes to that portability question there uh, is, is really what needs to be addressed. And, and the idea of focusing and within Europe, we always kind of focus on getting the best performance. And it's not necessarily that. Uh, I don't want to drag up the old Betamax versus VHS conversation, but um, but the reality is it, it's actually an adoption piece. And it's, it's it goes back to the original point of the UX, and especially as we start moving towards more edge-based applications how can we ensure that large companies and small companies can use those technologies to their best advantage while also not having to upskill themselves so much so uh, I'm, I'm almost dumbing it down if that makes sense and it goes to an os question i think mm -hmm. yeah. let well, me let me add something to, to the the to what heinrich especially said I mean, I have 60 startups in this in this office you can see behind me, and I founded two startups too. I already said that I started two startups, and just imagine, I mean, just using the the the, the European cloud services. Just imagine how much time you will lose because they don't have all the functionalities you're used to. <laughs> and Heinrich said that the big uh, the big uh, the big uh, service uh, uh, cloud uh, uh, cloud companies like AWS and. Microsoft and you name it, they, they, they're pumping out, I quote you, Heinrich, thousands of new features and automation every day or every month. And and, and, year, and that's year. just what you need a year or year. <laughs> you need to focus, yeah? Right? You need to focus as a startup and as, a, as an SME too, you need to focus on your business. You don't want to write unnecessary lines of code because that's super expensive. So what you want to do is you want to, you want to, Brendan said it, you want to pick the easiest route and it's not only about money. Right. If you if you pay one dollar more, who who cares? Or one euro more, who cares? It's about focus, speed, and and then then what Julian said is also true. How I mean, the the, the investor in the investor ecosystem in Germany is totally different. Who would put billions in a very risky business? I mean, we we call it venture capital in Germany, but it's actually not right. It's called uh, cash flow capital. Capital. Each and every f business that got enough cash flow gets funding, but all the others don't. And that's the European game we play, and we need to be uh, honest to ourselves here. And so, all I think all the opinions together form a very uh, sound picture of why we can't compete here. And, and yeah, at the moment. 
Uh, yeah, uh, well, I, I, must, I, I must agree with you. I also been in the States and compared how the, the money is flowing there and how the, the money is, is done in, in Europe and we are in, in completely different landscapes. So. But uh, I, that, yeah. that does me link to the first question that I haven't addressed so far, but um, and it's, oh, before it moves, it's, uh, do, you, uh, do any of the panelists see realistic business models built on data monetization? What are the value propositions that are really working for data exchange? In fact, how you make money out of data? Well, I can I can only speak for myself here, but uh, we've developed a series of products around the automation of, of, of well-known open source databases, being the idea to have an abstraction layer so that you don't have to put your data into something that's vendor specific. So your contract of your application is towards, let's say, Postgres, an open source database. And we provide automation um, to make a thousand Postgres databases, a thousand Postgres clusters, so to say, um, and make that consumable um, in an infrastructure agnostic way. So that's, first of all, it's addressing one of the problems, which means how do you avoid, you know, writing code that ties to a vendor specific API? And second, um, how do you monetize that? Well, if you if you have a, such a product and companies need that, then you basically will be able to monetize that with, with standard software licenses. Even so. Mm -hmm. Any other opinion on how to make money out of this, out of this business? Especially for the, when you are in the incubators, how do you see the, the companies, the startups, that when they are starting, how do they think that they will just make money just by just going into the cloud business? Brandon, do you want to go first? Yeah. No, I was going to go in a different angle, but I think um, if you want to start throwing it more to Enrique's question, then I can come in later. My main comment yeah. was essentially that in this context startups think they can just sell data somehow and and they kind of back in the day 10 it's more like a 10 year old idea that somehow if you collect data you can make money out of it because that's proven not to be true um it's it's more about from what we're seeing in terms of the future point of view is as we go into data models and and supporting the development of those and and the maintenance of those is where there may be something of interest but, but it's actually quite a difficult place, the idea of trying to create a data marketplace in the first place. I think, you know, it works in a public sector environment, in a smart city point of view. Uh, I don't see it happening so much in a more commercial applications. Um, whereas I think it's a question of sharing data and getting something back in return for sharing your data rather than making money directly off it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, we do have startups here making money with data. Uh, uh, Exactly, again, what Brandon said, um, just collecting and selling data, corporates won't won't buy that because in the end, what corporates care about is business, right? They want to make money. So you need them to present something they can more or less directly make money with, a product, not only the data in general. And, and what I see here is, what I see here is we do have a company, for example, that analyzes our Amazon business. It collects data from competitors and other stuff on Amazon and, and just gives us very clear feedback on what to do in order to increase our SIM card sales on Amazon. Very, I mean, in the end, a simple product, but simplicity, simplicity is always the best thing, right? And that's how we, how they make money with us. And the, and the second, uh, second startup we, we have here is, and that's a very German thing. Maybe I only talk for Germany. But again, GDPR is a topic. You, you can't do anything with your data, not even inside our company. I'm allowed to do everything I want with the data. So what they do is they synthesize the data. So yeah. each and every data point is not a real customer, any, customer anymore, but the statistical attributes, I hope I say the right word attributes, but I, I, I guess I, I, I yeah, hope you, you see what I mean. They stay the same. So now suddenly GDPR it doesn't uh, apply to the or I don't need to apply GDPR anymore and th that's how they make money with us. So so that's two different angles I have here on this topic in my in my community. From our point of view, in terms in terms of secondary use of data, so we work a lot with space tech companies. Um, sorry, and and really there's a huge amount of data produced. Then I don't know if anyone's familiar with Planet, um, who provide space imaging. 
And they've made a huge amount of money off, off that and have been a very successful scale up worldwide in that point of view. But actually, we have a lot of companies who are building the applications on the data provided from a bigger data supplier. So when we're talking about people who are able to, I don't know, um, track shipments across the air using using airplanes or also look at what's happening. I don't know. You see examples where uh, companies are able to support the oil spills or the management of oil rigs uh, from a distance and things like that. That's, of course, is a secondary use of data, but I'm not sure where it comes from in the cloud point of view, but it's more, as, as Florence says, it's, it's taking the data, adding value on top of it and creating the product, which allows decisions to be made is where the value is, not, not in data collection on itself. Yeah. Can reach. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm not 100% sure I understand the question fully because I think we have sectors like the financial sector where we have a lot of business that are built basically on data and data synthesization and everything. We have, in my view, the sector of inhomogeneous data like geodata that you capture from iPhones from the space and other places where you where, 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 where it's more difficult to, to create a marketplace for, because you have to, to work on it. And then we have personal data. And I think in the startup scene that I'm seeing, I see a lot of startups and, and also the larger ones still experimenting on the personal data side, um, especially because of regulations and GDPR, and the idea that you are the owner of your own data and how do you personally then sell this data through an intermediary. But I think it's there's a lot of experimentation. I'm I'm sure it will slowly come. Yeah, and this is also just links me to another question from the audience, and this is mostly for Tainlex. So we'll be ready for that uh, because it's also uh, links to this uh, data privacy and GDPR or data sovereignty. It says, uh, oh, let me call it. Uh, there are uh, certain compliance and legal regulations in any regions on the globe. How do you see the challenge of compatibility of legal compliance regulation and, of course, monitoring and audit? Yeah, well, and that's, of course, uh, monitoring. <laughs> that, that's, of course, a, a very uh, difficult topic. Um, the compatibility issue will not easily be resolved. In, in Europe, we've, we've tried to do it through uh, the intervention of regulations and directives to make uh, rules between countries, uh, between countries to sort of seem the same and have the same baseline or even become the same through regulations. But on a global scale, this proves to be very difficult. The GDPR or, or privacy is one area where this now becomes extremely visible with countries all over the globe now introducing uh, privacy acts. I mean, in the States, virtually any of the, of the states in the United States is working on privacy laws. At the federal level, they've tried it for years, but they don't get anywhere. Uh, you have the new Privacy Act in Brazil, many of the African countries are introducing them as well, and there is very little harmonization. Now, privacy is an area where this is peculiar in the sense that the GDPR has really worked as a model for a lot of the global privacy laws. So if you comply with GDPR, which still is one of the more strict regimes in the world, you have a very solid basis to start from. I'm, I'm not saying that you're perfect in every region of the world, but you've got a solid basis to start from. But there are many other areas of law where there is no compatibility at all. And it has traditionally been, traditionally been that way. If you want to do business in the physical world as well, in, in different countries in the world, you'll have to comply with the laws that are applicable locally and will have the same problem at uh, in, in the digital realm, it's, it's not a, a, a topic that can easily be resolved. For many com companies, that will mean if you want to uh, operate globally, you'll need to take into account the many different legal regimes and requirements that are out there. There is no one-stop stop, stop solution to have one approach that works everywhere. That said, there are a lot of initiatives, um, and we are part of that as well, where law firms and legal specialists from across the globe come together and try to create these legal maps on topics where you start to get an idea of what the baseline is in different countries and, and try to see whether you find a common denominator that will work for your business in a particular legal area. Yeah, would that yeah, also be a very small idea? Julian, or who's? 
Yeah, it's it's just a, a, a it, it's just a joke as a question. Uh, do you do you know how much? I would, I would, that's actually what I'd like to know. How much lifetime is destroyed every day by people having to select and click and accept cookies? Right, <laughs> <laughs> all of that. It's like every time I do that, I'm like, why did somebody make me do that? Yeah, I think that is a global frustration <laughs> right now. <laughs> that people have to click through all these cookie banners and consent frameworks and ultimately they often don't work and they have no real effect and there's nobody reading them. I mean, there was an idea to, to get rid of that whole system uh, with the introduction of the privacy regulation and put uh, the mechanisms in place where it's integrated in the browser, for instance. But as it is always the case, the legal the legislator works quite slowly and we're uh, we're still waiting on uh, on any movement on that front yeah well i in fact is uh, when i when i heard what, what i heard from from one uh, interviewee uh, we were talking about yes uh the difference between europe and, and the states and uh well you saw the uh, europe is uh, putting pretty much effort on the, what they call the european values are so one of them is data privacy okay so this is this is more or less work at a european level by maybe just some public authorities while uh, in the states uh, they are, they do not rely on 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 the government just to to work on the on the privacy issues. They just move it into the, the different states, the federal states. They they just have the, the different privacy acts. So uh, then when uh, so that's what as, as as an SME. I mean, when you are just or a startup, as you will like just later on just going to the uh, you know uh, the American market, and uh, and then you face with all this problems uh, with probably refrain you just for your business. Uh, I don't know if, it, if there is an easy way just to help uh, those those people, those companies that they will try just to move from Europe to other uh, to other markets and at the same time uh, fulfill the privacy issues in the other regions. There are, I mean, most of the law firms, ours as well, that now work on an international scale, we all have access to um legal databases and legal tools that help us to quickly see and select select the the legal instruments that are applicable to a region where a company wants to move to so for those who know where to look it is not all that difficult to assess what the uh, legal requirements will be and that is accessible to smes as well it's not only the the large well large companies do that internally when they have sufficiently large legal departments, they would uh, they would build up that knowledge internally and try to scale, legally scale uh, internally as well. For SMEs, there are service providers like we are and many others that can help companies get access to mm -hmm. the same resources without building them internally. Yeah, that's Enrique, let me add something. Yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, um, I mean, I mean, I don't. I'm not sure if getting the information is nowadays, uh, let's say, uh, the the threshold anymore. Because I, I only speak, and I can only add to what Ruben said, and I can only speak for Germany. But if you are a, a startup started or founded in Germany, the German government helps you to get all the necessary information in each and every country because we do have startup representatives in most of the countries. So you just go there, you get all the information you need, then possibly the representative will um, will then say, hey, Ruben can help you too. Um, we, we have worked with them, but that's not the, that's not the issue, right? Um, let's just imagine, again, being a startup, you get all the information, but then you need to A, process the information and B, change your product. And again, writing lines of code is super expensive. And that's, I think, the issue here. I was going to add as well, there's the opportunity there for the reg tech, uh, the reg tech and the compliance tech marketplace to fill in. I think probably the best parallel we have is with the fin within the finance industry. So there's a huge amount of compliance had to come in with the PSD2. Uh, and actually a lot of it was tech based and whole startups built around that. And I think if I was an SME, knowledge is one thing, but actually knowing what to do with it and how to bring it in is a completely different resource very high resource that you're asking on such a small company i think actually what what you need to have is those intermediary suppliers who do offer compliance by default 
uh, so you don't have to worry about it. And I think that's what's being sold within a fintech environment and that needs to come into all uh, cloud environments, especially within this point of view. Because uh, as you say, Florian, you can go around all member states of the European Union, all countries, but actually that the cost of doing that to the company when you have a team of 10, 20, 50 is too high. It's something that is a big company luxury. And what we need is players to come in and provide those intermediary applications or, or APIs or whatever it is that actually means I don't have to worry about it, uh, that this has already been sorted and automatically integrated into my cloud system. But I, I think that that is part of the solution because in reality you see that for any industry, any, any of them, even the financial one, there is not one single automated tech solution that will get you there. Many of them will help you certainly and, and get you to a certain level, which at a certain level in your growth path may be sufficient. But there are none that will actually get there where you completely need to be. So there will always be that, that additional layer where as an SME, you'll need outside help to help you interpret all the information that you have access to and apply it, obviously. I, I uh, think that's well, a very yeah. good point. Hmm. Um, no, I mean, just go ahead. I think it's a very good point, and I, you know, that triggers a, a, a cascade of thoughts. Um, in Europe, with GDPR, um, if you think about founding an organization to explore a product market fit, to use lean startup terms. The question is how much runway, how much money do you need to have a certain amount of revolutions with your lean engine, experiment, experimenting with software until you get to an economically viable product. Now, if you, if you take the burden of, um, uh, of GDPR and, and all you know, comparable legislation the, that also comes from the, the federal nature of Europe, you'll see that there are, there are significant competitive disadvantages, especially for small organizations. And it, we, we earlier spoke about that there is not as much money in, in available for, you know, as venture capital as, if, for example, in the US. The question is, where is the money in Europe? Because the question should not be, does, money have, uh, does Europe have money? Because we do have money, but the, the money is in the large organizations. And these large organizations, they can, you know, use uh, leg legislation just such as GDPR to protect themselves from startups by making it harder to, to, to find a product market fit. So there are opinions, and I'm not saying it's my opinion, but there are opinions stating that uh, this kind of legislation is not only good, but it's also to some degree um, a disruption break. It, it actually it is a decatalyst, so to say. Um, not sure whether it was meant to serve that purpose, but to a certain degree, it may does. <laughs> But Julian, if I may add to that, to, to very quickly pick in on it, I don't think it's entirely fair to only look at the law in and of itself. It's also how we as Europeans look at laws, because ultimately for a client, we, we looked at uh, data retention laws in the US. There are 10,000 retention rules in the US at the federal level alone. I'm not speaking about the state level. United States laws are very complicated. But American startups look at the law very differently than we do. We are extremely risk averse when it comes to compliance, whereas mm. American companies, at least startups, are much more prone to take risks in that area. It's, it's also very a matter of, and I think you're right, it's the same thing what you said with, with the venture capitalists. The way we approach risk is very different from how they do it it's in the US and it's the problem. Uh, uh, sorry guys, uh, I need to interrupt there because we need to wrap up. Uh, it was a very interesting discussion. I will stay one hour more with all of you. I mean, and there are still a couple of questions that we have not been able to answer from the audience, but so we only have 50, 50 seconds. Uh, so it's, uh, to me, it has been incredible. Uh, I don't know if, if, they, if they will stop me just when they reach their zero, zero, zero counter. But uh, in case uh, it's that, just, uh, just one final word, just to thank you all of them, Henrich, Ruben, Julian, Florian, and Brendan. I mean, your your opinions are being value, valuable. I guess that the, there is room for more kind of these kind of panels, because I mean, uh, the 
the world from SMEs, from uh, from incubators, and also from the legal departments, I think need to be heard. I mean, there's a lot of things to be discussed, and uh, most of the time we pay more attention to big stakeholders and not to the to the ones that take uh, the movement in the in the market faster. So, uh, so yes, thanks to all of them, to, to all of you. Sorry, <laughs> I mean, I really appreciate your help and your, your opinions. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Have a nice one. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you, gentlemen. This is a really great uh, session. A lot of uh, fascinating concept, uh, concepts, perspectives, insights into the market uh, in Europe. So that wraps up this session, and we will be uh, closing for the lunch hour. So uh, this finishes things up, and in one hour we'll uh, reconvene for a, a session to be moderated by Angel Giuliano on success stories and use cases from the European Cloud Committee. So I look forward to seeing you, seeing you all in about 60 minutes. All the best. <laughs>